We're back. It's only been a couple of weeks, but we are back talking NASCAR and a little F1 here on, well, I guess it's Mystery Caution. Yeah, I think it's Mystery Caution. I'm trying to remember exactly how we did this, but yeah, this is Mystery Caution. Don't forget to subscribe here to Mystery Caution. Our subscriber base is starting to go. I think we're almost reached 100 subscribers now, but uh, we're still going to uh, do uh, actually post all of our uh, uh, caution. Uh, actually, it's going to be our qualifying starting lineup videos on Saturday on Prime Sports Network. So just keep that in mind. Uh, mystery caution here. Uh, we're going to, uh, and by the way, this is Wednesday, as you know, um, put out a little announcement on Discord. So if you want to know, hey, why is the show on on Tuesday? Is that usually when you do it? Well, you can check Discord. That's why we have a link in the description for that. That's where we'll post comments, uh, last minute changes, schedule things. Um, so we're recording on Wednesday because CJ had no electric yesterday. So uh, anyway. 10 minutes, ten minutes before showtime. Uh, yeah, perfect timing. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So anyway, CJ, good to have you back. Uh <laughs> What a crazy couple of weeks in F1. Because we're going to start off with F1. We're going to uh, do a quick recap of what happened in F1. We're going to recap what happened at the Brickyard. And then go into the preview of the Cookout 400 at Richmond. So, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was it, really these last couple of weeks at F1 have been the most controversial all season. And um, uh, it, it, this is what you really don't want. But I don't really think the F1 community. I mean, I'm just going to guess that the fans, the overall fans, um, there are a, a certain amount of them that did care what happened over the last couple of weeks, especially two weeks ago in Hungary. Um, but I don't think that it's as much as say the fans here in the United States would feel. I think if here we're, like 90% of us are probably like, this is ridiculous. What is this? I mean, I thought I thought NASCAR uh, treated uh, their sport like uh, wrestling. Uh, now uh, F1 has really gone overboard. Uh, but there's still, I'm sure, a lot of apologists uh, in the F1 uh, fan base that just, hey, that's the sport. That's what we do. I'm okay with it. Even though there were a lot of people uh, and fans at F1 that were pretty unhappy with what took place in Hungary. Yeah, uh, it feels like to me we are going back or have gone back to the days of Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello at Ferrari, where everything was engineered for Michael Schumacher to maximize points to be able to lock up that championship. Um, the really disappointing thing, I think, here is that we've waited for so long within Formula One to have some real competition. And now we finally got it. We finally got a four way fight. And then it's completely overshadowed by, again, McLaren that just continue to screw over their drivers. It's like they cannot make a decision that makes it easy on themselves. I think Lando Norris said we make it overly difficult on ourselves and, and they clearly do. They've screwed Norris out of several um, chances at a win, just like Ryan Blaney's crew would mess him up. Uh, they've done it to, to Lando Norris and then Hungary was like the quintessential example of them shooting themselves in the foot by deciding mid-race to uh, give Lando Norris the undercut, which ended up giving him the lead, only then to say, oh, Piastri actually, based on what we discussed before the race, should actually be ahead. So Lando, why don't you slow down and pull over? Which is not a good look for the sport at all. McLaren should just be focused on letting their cars fight. Actually, all the teams should be doing that. Let us Give us the four-way battle eight-way eight driver and minus Perez. So seven driver, four-way four -way, uh, team fight to be able to go for the win. And that's going to be the best thing for the sport, but uh, they do not let that happen for whatever reason. So uh, was the biggest take on this though from an F1 excuse kind of way that, because uh, Norris kind of said it a few times, which was really um, it, next time he they just need to make or he needs to make the decision quicker to give him a, a chance to win the race. It was the fact that he knew that he was going to relinquish the lead, but he needed to do it quicker. So he'd have more time to try and win it fair it, it, over Piastri instead of waiting so long where he really didn't have a chance at that point. That's one way to look at it. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, you know. <laughs> I think that's a political answer uh, because he's employed by the team that screwed him over. I, I, the Based on where he where he was called in at, I mean, he won, you could argue, and he could argue and should argue that he won, had the lead 
you know, fair and square right then. Why did he have to slow down and, and give it up? Um, McLaren, their their strategy has just been messed up. They put Norris on wrong tires at least once, possibly twice. They pinned him uh, at the wrong time too late in Canada. He lost a chance there. Uh, now this, um, you know, he, he they, they gave him the lead based on the strategy that they called for him, only to say, well, actually, really, Piastri, your teammate should be ahead, so we need you to slow down. So, I mean, that's three that I can count right off the top of my head this season where McLaren has completely screwed over Norris. So I'm kind of surprised that you said that. Yeah, I mean, if you want to have a, you know, if you want to please the team based on what you had previously agreed to in terms of how the race may play out, yeah, that's one approach. But you could also, he could also argue that the strategy that he was on rightfully gave him the lead and he should be able to stay there too. Yeah, I'm sure there's, uh, let me see if, uh, probably get it in one of these other uh, prime tire emails. I'll have to check it out because I'm sure that, yeah, I remember there was a, uh, a clip in there regarding uh, another poll, which the polls are kind of funny. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I uh, wanted to see if I can uh, get the poll here. But anyway, uh, while I do that, let's take a look at uh, – because this is interesting. This is what happens in Belgium. I thought this was kind of funny then. So we're going to play – actually, you know what? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, you're not going to see the uh, – I'm not going to show it because they'll flag us. So I'm just going to play the audio. And this is the only thing that I wanted to play anyways, the audio. So check this audio out. This is Belgium the week later. And listen to this. I, I found this very curious listening to this. Wait, wait. Hold on one second. I have to make sure. See, I'm, I'm, it's been a couple of weeks. I'm glad I caught that. i got to make sure that the audio is on for everybody. Okay, here we go. George Russell and T Warner's might allow Lewis Hamilton to get past, given how long Russell has been on those tyres. But they've decided at Mercedes, Piastri is too far back to challenge their one two, so they're letting them scrap it out. Okay, so what? I mean, <laughs> it just happened last week, and now you're doing it again? Now you're talking about doing it again? I mean, come on, these guys, it's like you don't have any, like, uh, are they even getting what's going on here? Not, I'm not blaming the announcer, obviously, because he's talking about the strategy that's actually going on at, at, with this team. It's like, didn't you just know what, to, I mean, it's like having absolutely, I don't know, they just have absolutely no concept of what's going on with their sport right now. <laughs> yeah, and it's the structure of Formula One. So we've talked about it a couple of times where the most important thing in Formula One by far is the team championship. So teams need to maximize those points. It matters way more than the driver's championship. That's how everybody gets paid. So they are going to do absolutely everything they can, driver be damned, to make sure that their team gets the maximum points. So in that instance, in the middle of the race where your strategy is playing out, and you've got one of your two drivers uh, that may have the chance to be able to pull away and more comfortably get a lead and potentially the win, you know, give them the advantage. You're going to want to enable them to do so. So uh, Mercedes could have made the call there and, and may have made the call to enable Hamilton to get by Russell in order to give him the advantage to be able to secure at least one of their two drivers some maximum points uh, ahead of Piastri and McLaren. Uh, whereas letting the two race, letting Russell and Hamilton race each other, potentially slow them down. You may potentially end up with contact and one of them gets taken out, if not both. And then you also run the potential of Piastri catching them and, and losing points in that way. Uh, in the end in Belgium, obviously uh, Mercedes made a massive mistake with George Russell, who crossed the line first. Uh, he was underweight and subsequently disqualified, and the win came into Hamilton. So at, at the end of the day, it didn't matter, uh, which again, you know, for Mercedes, that's, that's a big mistake to make. And there are several theories as to why that happened, um, most of which is that usually on after a race, the drivers will go around and they'll pick up the their hot tires. They'll they'll drive offline, so they'll pick up all the marbles. That adds weight to the car. 
to make sure that they're they're safe. At Belgium, the lap is so long that they do not do that cool down lap. They immediately go into the pits after they cross the line. So Russell didn't have time to go get any pickup, and you know he didn't miss weight by all that much. But nonetheless, he did miss weight, so he ended up being disqualified. Which again, you've got these weird um, incentives for team results and all this good kind of stuff that um, ultimately kind of ruin the show from a, a fan point of view. You want to see the individuals. I mean, they're individual cars, individual drivers. You want to see who comes out best and on top. And we finally have a four-way fight and two weeks in a row, you take it away from us. Yeah, this is what everybody has been asking for fan-wise for Formula One for the past three years now. We finally get it. And the two weeks we have it, you take it away. So how often has a driver been disqualified from winning? Not often at all. It's been a long time. Wow. Uh, maybe the last one was um, possibly Schumacher uh, at, at Japan when he crashed into Villeneuve, perhaps. Uh, and something, you know, it, it's been a very long time since somebody's gone out. I mean, they took took one away in the Prost and Senna years where Senna and uh, Prost had intentional contact in the past. So those have happened. But again, it's been it's been a very long time since they've taken a win away. You know, one of the other thing I was noticing when I was watching, we talked about this a few weeks ago regarding the how hard it is sometimes because the NASCAR, you got the sponsorships on the cars mm -hmm. and everybody can identify. And by the way, even though I agree and I think at some point it could be another 20 years that eventually they're going to get rid of the every individual team needs a sponsor. It's just going to happen. And we'll get into that at some point, definitely in the next few weeks, because that was also a big story that's been going around in NASCAR. Uh, with uh, the charters and, uh, mm -hmm. and and they've got to kind of get together now. They have to kind of establish. So I can't even believe I'm saying this, but I want the drivers to establish, establish a union of some sort, uh, which I'm usually totally against in, in like some of my other sports. <laughs> but for some reason, I'm like, I, I, I know NASCAR needs it. Um, anyway, so um, I think it's important that, uh, uh, well, I don't even, my train of thought is totally gone. What was I saying? <laughs> A uh, single sponsorship across. Yeah, the single team. sponsorship. So it was very <laughs> difficult to um, understand when you're following F1 for the first time uh, who's who, and then yep. when you're watching the race and you see the scoreboard, it's like I, I can't figure out the scoreboard. It doesn't make any sense. It's like they've got drivers in certain positions that are really not in that position, but they put them there, and the times are all off, and I just don't. I can't follow it. If I'm not a diehard F1 guy, I don't. Why do they put that scoreboard the way they put it? Why don't they just have it like NASCAR? If you're in first, you're in first. If you're in fifth, you're in fifth. Not this like, you know, weird looking thing that says you're 28 seconds back, but you're in sec. I don't understand it. Yeah, that happened a couple of years ago. So um, I, I think they started partnering with, uh, I think it's Amazon, if I'm not mistaken, some of their. Um, to highlight the analytics, the real time analytics uh, type of type of stuff. So they make all these predictions and they put these wild hypotheses up on the screen that ultimately can end up being fairly confusing and don't always end up playing out correctly. But uh, to your point, like if, if the from time to time they will put somebody who is call it third position and they'll have a predictive uh, if they haven't stopped yet they'll have a predictive uh window of time in which they could get the stop in and potentially close to make the pass for the lead type of thing but the person's in third position because you're in the middle of a pit stop sequence yeah it gets really confusing really quickly so if you're not watching the race from, from lap start one, to finish yeah. very start to finish yeah. you are going to be lost at times yes i, uh, I agree with that yeah. okay <laughs> yeah I, I didn't think that was something i was uh alone in but all right uh let's uh go through a few other things here uh let's see uh we had um an announcement we didn't talk about this right we did not. Nope. Yeah. Haas switching out both of their drivers for 2025. Um, very interesting. They're bringing in Ali Berman um, and um, was it o Ocon from um, who is unceremoniously getting booted out of Alpine. Um, so yeah, Haas feels the need to make up some make some significant shakeups within their lineup. I think uh, another big story that we didn't get the chance to talk about as well, or it happened while I was gone or we were gone, was uh, Carlos Sainz fall, finally uh, deciding where he's going to go after Lewis Hamilton takes his spot at Ferrari. Sainz has agreed to go to Williams for 2025. Okay. 
are they pretty much like NASCAR with their silly season? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's still a lot of questions about Max Verstappen. Um, I, you know, this year, 2024, we talked about it in the preview show. It's the first time in I, that I recall where absolutely no driver had changed. Uh, every team entered 2024 with the same lineup they had in 2023. Uh, this is more of a regular type of silly season at this point. Um, I think there are still some outstanding questions about Verstappen, potentially Perez as well. Uh, but all of the major things, uh, major seats that are out there at the moment, unless something changes, aside from Mercedes, uh, Mercedes has one open spot that they have yet to fill. Um, all the major moves are pretty much done at this point. But yeah, uh, relatively similar to NASCAR, though 2024 was an anomaly. Okay. So let's see, what else did they have here? Why do we care about Marvel with Esteban Ocon? They join Haas uh, in 25. Bring him, bring him money to the sport, most so, likely. So his, his ability to secure a seat uh, being backed up by someone else's checkbook. Okay. Oh, here we go. Readers rate the Hungarian GP. <laughs> it was good, 45%. It was amazing, 35%. So 80% thought it was either good or amazing, which they should have, I guess. Um, but, uh, again, the problem was, uh, I guess, what happened. Because, you know, you do have this, and then you have, let's see, manufactured drama. Yep. Does not a great race make. Yeah. Too much unnecessary drama. Team orders. Lando should have won. It was awful. Hmm. F1 at its absolute worst. Compelling racing until <laughs> they told the driver with a six second lead to give up the lead. Schumacher, Lewis, and Senna would never have given up a lead that big on team orders. Lando doesn't have the medal to be world champion. Do you they, agree with that? <laughs> no. They, uh, <laughs> I can point to Austria, uh, where Schumacher, um, uh, Rubens Barrichello, I should say, gave it up to Schumacher. So, All right. Okay. That's F1. So uh, let's, let's see here. Where are we? Um, let's go ahead and talk NASCAR. So... More controversy. More controversy, yes. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and what, what, what's that? let's see. What do we start with? Let's start with – which one do I want to start with? Okay. Let's start in order. Okay. So uh, as we all recall, uh, the big point was when Brad Keselowski – we were the big point of the race was Kyle Busch wrecking with – Denny Hamlin trying to get into fourth, I think, fourth or fifth. And um, that brought up the caution. Otherwise, uh, we were having a really good last three lap race between Kozlowski, who everybody thought was getting ready to run out of gas. He was holding up Blaney, and Larson was coming really, really charging. Uh, even though it had been a few laps, he still couldn't get past Blaney. But again, as much as that was exciting, the fact is, uh, it just it was it was it was the brickyard for NASCAR. It's like you, you can't pass, uh, and that's not good. So um, yeah, so that really now look. I don't. That's what, I know. Some people probably blame Kyle. Like, why are you doing this? There's only you, you know what's a big deal being fourth or fifth or fifth or sixth. I forget what it was, but I don't agree with that. I mean, sure you don't want him to wreck. And I thought that sucked as, as, as uh, going for Blaney, of course. But uh, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if there's going to be a, like what happened. Run out of gas, a few restarts, this and that. Kyle, th theoretically, was still trying to say, so I could still win this race if something happens. So I was okay with him getting a little bit aggressive at that point. Um, but still, it sucked because. I, I would that would have been much better because everything after that is where we had some unnecessary controversy and drama. I'm sure NASCAR was probably pissed at Kyle. Maybe Kyle, that's why Kyle did it. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a no, that's a conspiracy theory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How can they screw NASCAR? Uh, so, um, okay. So uh, 
let's take a look at the restart. Now I'm going to not put audio here. Okay, so let's uh, do just do that so you don't hear it. Okay, so let me pop it in. There you go. All right, so here we go. Now this is the thing, I, and I've got to throw this in there. Nobody's really talked about it. Uh, maybe because I'm just an idiot, but uh, you know what? I don't want to hear that either. Okay, so here we go. By the way, uh, what you're going to hear or see for these NASCAR Brickyard highlights are all coming from uh, to a website called uh, Beating and Bang the Beating the Beating and Banging Channel. It's a YouTube channel. Uh, I think he does a pretty good job, and I'm giving him credit uh, where credits due, and we're taking uh, clips from his channel. So check that channel out. So here we go this is the time where kozlowski i'm running out of gas i gotta come out all right so i gotta ask you a quick question on this so this is penske i mean a former penske driver okay kozlowski so he's a ford and he basically just fucked his former team and <laughs> manufacturer current manufacturer well, I, i'm not sure i'd be pretty happy about that if i'm you know, Roger Penske, if I'm the, the that team, if I'm Ford. I mean, you, you basically just fucked Ryan Blaney by doing that. I mean, if you're going to, if you, if I mean, just stay out there or don't. But don't do that. That's the worst possible thing you could have done to screw us. So, again, nobody talked about it, but I just thought that was interesting considering, like I said, it's a guy that worked for Penske and he's just screwed Penske. It's a fair point of view. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of opportunity knowing that he was going to be out of fuel. Um, you know, obviously a last second decision um, shot him right down. It was the worst possible timing, but there's plenty of opportunity. It's a 2.5 mile track to be able to communicate to folks and potentially put yourself, put your car in a position uh, with the um, warm up and cool down lanes that they've got at that um, facility to be able to indicate that you're going to peel off um, to do it you know, just a couple of yards before the restart zone there it is, is pretty bad. Left, left the entire field uh, with giant question marks as to what was going on. Uh, Larson certainly took advantage of it. <laughs> yeah. And then this is the other controversy. So we see, uh, let's see, it's um, not there, but here, that right line. there. So that's the line that he, that he jumps. So he clearly jumps the line, even though it's very, very small. I know some people are like, well, I'm not sure if you come on. He jumped it. It, it, it was very small. It wasn't as uh, big as Denny Hamlin, even though Denny Hamlin was winning, which we'll get to, by the way, when we're talking about the race that happened at Richmond earlier this year. Um, mm -hmm. Ironic that these are the two races that uh, we're talking about. But um, uh, anyway, um, so that restart there again i mean there's a lot of inconsistency once again at nascar they probably should have done something with hamlin back at the, the richmond race earlier this year they didn't they should have done something here uh they didn't uh the next time they i tell you right now the next time they get unless it's kyle larson the next guy that they do penalize for jumping the gun that guy is going to be really upset. <laughs> that guy is going to be, he, he, and he better be. It better not be anybody I got money on. I'll tell you that right now. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, interesting. Yeah. Hamlin's um, from Richmond very much recall that. This one, it looks like it. And um, they actually published the data as to when the throttles were hit. And um, everybody was pretty much right on at the same time. I think. So, so I, I guess data wise, probably too small of a margin to call. If you didn't call Hamlin, then you definitely can't call it here. The data doesn't support it. Um, I, I do think that the confusion as to who actually held control of the field at that time is really what needs to be addressed. And they've got to have some procedures for if you're the lead, if you're the control car, like if you pit, you know, 10 yards before the restart zone, Un, unprompted, like with no warning, then it's got to be some kind of repercussion or protocol to be able to enable the field to have a fair fight. And Kyle Larson just happened to be in the perfect spot at the perfect time. Um, and 
So By the way, that would have been a monumentally dumb thing for Kyle Larson to do, considering he had put himself in perfect position. There was no way Ryan Blaney was going to beat him anyway. Yep. So that would have been a really stupid move by Kyle Larson to jump the gun there, uh, considering he had the inside track. And again, another bad thing about the Brickyard uh, for NASCAR. I totally agree. It's just completely unfair uh, if you're on the outside. Okay, so <laughs> look, I have been saying this for a, a while as a Ryan Blaney fan. I said this a lot more before he won the championship because I did feel when he talked about it last year that I thought that he was getting better with his, his emotions. He was channeling them the right way. He needed to be more aggressive. He needed to be more tough. And I think that did help him on his way to winning a championship. So uh, I, I just loved him when when he, he went ahead and uh, really went off. So let's, uh, let's take a listen in case you haven't heard what Ryan Blaney said at the time. Fucking bullshit. No fucking way that he gets to jump up a row and I get fucked because someone runs that again. That's fucking bullshit. That is fucking bullshit, NASCAR, and you fucking know it. Y'all better change something. He might have jumped the start there. I don't give a shit. That's fucking bullshit. There's no way they should have let that go green. That's ridiculous. They just gave it to him. It ain't over. That's fucking over. I'm on the top. <laughs> Go win from the top. <laughs> Give it to fucking Golden Boy. Son of a bitch. <laughs> I just love that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like the little Golden Boy thing there, too, at the end. That's <laughs> uh, just awesome. Anyway. So. Yeah, I mean, he called it exactly as I did. Like, you've got to have some kind of protocol. There's the entire field is confused, or at least the first three rows that saw Kozlowski peel off there. Like, who who then is in charge? Like, who who's the lead car? Who who do you accelerate on? Do you have to wait for the green? Should you take an extra lap, NASCAR, based on the fact that your entire inside row shot up? You know, people who did the choose rule now get screwed as well. So, uh, whole whole host of things to consider there. He's absolutely right. Okay, and then this is the controversy at the end of the race. Yes, there's more. And so, yeah, here we go. Ryan Priest can't get the car started, and they decide. See, look, here's the deal. First of all, Kyle Larson is not getting beat. Okay, so we knew that. All right. Second of all. And I'm saying, like, if they would have just kept it going, I'm okay with that. Um, that's what we want. We want every race. We don't want any race ended under yellow. That's just, that's awful. Um, so, but again, it's just, it, 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 I don't understand what's going on. I just don't. I don't understand why these are difficult decisions. And this is why fans get upset and, and, and they come out with these controversial you know, say what you want about if they're they're scripted and all this other. But they leave themselves open to this criticism, NASCAR. That's the problem. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to criticize the 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 people who are being critical, maybe even overly critical. Let them be, because NASCAR is doing a bad job, especially when they basically when it's over and everybody knows they're wrong. They always say we're right. It was the right thing to do. It was the right call. They, I mean, I don't hardly ever hear them say well oh yeah we screwed up i mean that just doesn't happen very often yeah that's always been the nascar way it's been an infallible family business for since time of inception and uh you know indycar has gone through its fair share of poor race directors formula one has had their fair share and to those series credits they've they made changes and nascar makes changes too but it's the culture within this series that NASCAR is infallible. Uh, NASCAR always has the final say in absolutely every single scenario, and they always back one another up in the public eye and, and the press releases afterward. Um, and yeah, in, in, a, in an age of transparency, specifically with fans and with all the betting that goes on in relation to these sports, I, I do think that they should be a little bit more forthcoming in you know admitting where, where things are needed yeah. improvement yeah it's uh and again with kyle larson and the lead and then I mean, that's the that's the thing you know yep. 
and I and we know I I don't think it's on it's done on purpose, not me, but it just looks that way. Okay. Now let's finally get to previewing the race. Uh, the main reason I'm sure everybody's here for our preview of the Cookout 400. This is the second Richmond race. So we had a race at Richmond. What was it? March, I believe. So, uh, and that was the Toyota Owners 400. March 30. Yep. And that was Hamlin's win. And I don't, we, I don't, yeah, we don't have highlights of that, but just recall that that was the situation with Martin Shrugs Jr. dominated. It was his best race of the year. He led 228 laps. He was a lap away from taking the check, from taking the, the, the with the white and, um, and then Bubba Wallace uh, decides to uh, take it out on Kyle Larson. And Caution comes out. And Denny Hamlin comes out of the pits with the lead and jumps the gun, even though he was, he was leading. But he clearly jumped the gun. They didn't call it. And Denny Hamlin uh, went on to win, even though he only led 17 laps to Truex's 228. Larson led 144. Logano finished second, but uh, that was really Trex didn't know it at the time, but uh, boy, that was his opportunity to get a win and guarantee the spot in the postseason. Now he's sweating it out. Uh, and uh, but remember, I, I was critical of Truex at the time because I didn't think he was upset enough. I think he should have been really, really upset, not at NASCAR, not at Denny Hamlin, but at Bubba Wallace. That was a situation where in the old days, a driver would have found out Bubba and they would have had words and maybe more than that. He didn't even have words with Bubba. Yeah, and recall his teammate, Martin Truex's teammate, is Bubba Wallace's car owner who ended up benefiting too. So, yeah, a whole host of weird circumstances that played into that. But, yeah, you you were spot on. You know, hindsight being twenty twenty, very much should have been. He's in good position, you know, with uh, as few races as we have left to go. But still, um could have been in a much better position had that not happened. Yeah, and uh, as far as the NASCAR, st- the playoff standings, how many more races we have left? Four. Wow, it's amazing, right? Four yep. races to go. We're Four to ready. go before the final ten. Yep. Yeah, let me uh, see what the playoff. Uh, let's see what we got here. So. Uh, let's put the playoff picture in there. And oddly enough, it's Bubba Wallace who is up on first on the outside looking in. Okay, yeah, that's it. Seven points. So there you go. Because Gibbs looks like he's in pretty decent shape, forty-two up. Mm-hmm. But here is the ones that are, in, and, and yeah, even though Truex is sweating it out, he's in really good shape. He's one hundred eight. I mean, the, I guess the worst case scenario is, which is not going to happen, is four new drivers winning. You know, that's not going to happen but yeah I, I agree i think after this week assuming we don't get a first time winner i should say and it's not true x I, I would say we can pretty much count him in uh all right so busher and chastain they're the ones that are in really really uh a, a dog fight and then you have bob on the outside for it really that's what it is it's a three race hmm? run right now busher chastain and wallace uh, you know it's not going to be easy for Gibbs to lose the playoff spot. And it's not going to be easy for anyone else on the outside to get the playoff spot. Uh, even though Briscoe and Bush are only in 18th and 19th, as you can see, they're way back. So that's going to take a win for one of those guys, which would completely throw, you know, Ross Chastain out. Uh, Bubba Wallace would be uh, even further out at that point. So um, it's going to take a win for pretty much anybody besides Bubba Wallace that's on the outside looking in right now. Okay, so now let's uh, let's just take a look at what the futures look like. So futures. This is from Draft uh, Kings and Larson and Hamlin and Bell. It's pretty much the same. There's Byron. Uh, Blaney is still getting a respectable eight to eight to one. I still say it's a really good number for for Blaney at this point. Elliot is ten. Uh, Reddick is a good number. Logano, you know, I know you've talked about him a few times this season as a good bargain. True Rex is now maybe a nice bargain, but he's got to get going. I mean, there's no reason mm-hmm. to, but he has time. You know, all you got to do is get hot now. So he has time. And he, and this is the reset. This is a two-week reset. 
So this is going to be a big week for drivers that are that were cold going into the break uh, because you don't want to start cold out of the break. This is your opportunity to reset and, and get going. Start your playoff championship run now. Uh, and guys like Truex, Logano, and so forth, Kozlowski even, Busher even, uh, Bowman was, was looking good at towards the end. There. Gibbs uh, has to get it going. I don't know what's up with Chastain. He's just not really... I'm not sure he's going to make the playoffs, to tell you the truth, the way he's going. I would agree. And then you've got the bigger long shots. I mean, Kyle is talking about a reset. <laughs> we'll see if Kyle... <laughs> It's a whole new season. <laughs> you would you would think so. Yeah, I think that's uh, where we're at right now. So, all right. So now we've got <clears throat> the race in hand to cook out 400. All right. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I know. All right. So <laughs> let's get into this. Uh, so the last 12 winners. Now, this is going to be for, again, uh, check out Prime Sports Network. We're going to have the starting lineup video on Saturday, I believe. When's the race on Sunday? Is that a late race? That's a good question. Um, my yes. guess is... 6.30. Oh, wonderful. Why is that? Uh, What's on? There's, a, there's no holiday Sunday on Monday. Night. These are fantastic. Yeah. Sunday, 6.30. Love Sunday night races. Yeah, that's <laughs> what the hell is that about? All right. Anyway, so uh, I will be on depending <clears throat> depending on when qualifying is. Again, I'm just guessing that it's uh, going to be on Saturday, whatever. So we'll post that at Prime Sports and uh, we'll go over this. But my, the reason I'm referencing that is because uh, that's going to be a good update. Uh, qualifying does not matter very much. At Richmond, the 10 of the last 12 winners started outside the top seven. Seven of the last 12 outside the top 10. And and uh, and and so what that's telling you is, is that what you want to see is you want to see a driver that you like not qualify in the top 10 so your odds are more beneficial. And hopefully, uh, even though the, the top drivers like these guys here no matter what they do, unless they qualify 35th even. But I don't know. I'm sure that's going to matter. Uh, these guys are still going to be low, no matter what they qualify. That's just been Vegas, and, and it's deservedly so, based on what we'll get into the, how these guys have done at this track. All right. The manufacturers have all been uh, equal over the last three races. But Chevy's the one that I think has got the biggest problem, wouldn't you say? Um, they've only won one out of 16 at Richmond. Yep. Two out of the last, excuse me, one out of the last six. Two out of the last 12. But also keep in mind, one one top six at New Hampshire and one top 12 at Phoenix this year. And those are going to be the two tracks that we're also going to look at, even though we have a Richmond race to look at. So it's a little bit different when you've got a race already at the track to look at. That's the biggest handicapping tool right there. What happened at Richmond early this year? Number one. Number two, you can kind of throw in all right, how did they do it, New Hampshire and Phoenix? Uh, being that they're both flat tracks, they're both a mile tracks, they're the most similar. And then you could also say Gateway uh, and Iowa are pretty similar too, but we don't have a whole lot going on with Gateway and Iowa as far as, you know, history. Um, so anyway, uh, would you? Would, so you would agree that you're not going to really, Chevy is probably not the way you're going to go this week. No, Toyota has been very strong here. And I think even if you look to the last race, uh, Toyota pretty much dominated it. Yeah, you had Larson that came out and led 144 laps. But Toyota won. A Toyota dominated. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, this is Toyota. To me, this is a Toyota track. The second choice would be the Fords. Um, Chevrolet, you know, don't highly discount them. It's not like some of the other tracks where they haven't won in forever. Uh, but I think to me, this is a, this is a clear Toyota favorite track. Let's see here. Where did they put it? There we go. See, now, again, they completely yeah. disrespect Ford all the time. I just yep. don't understand it. I don't understand it. They've won the championship the last two years. And they've also been winning races lately. I don't get this. There's got to be a numbers game. It's got to be a numbers game because you got so many top Toyota drivers. You got so many top Chevrolet drivers. You have a couple. It's really just Penske uh, and and uh, 
you know, Blaney and um, Logano there. You could throw in Keselowski and, and Busher, uh, but they just don't have the numbers against Toyota and Chevrolet, and I think that's why you get the uh, the disparity there. Okay. So, uh, once again, just quickly, you had Christopher Bell winning Phoenix. He led 50 laps there. Um, and Chevy, as I mentioned, only had one in the top 12. Uh, you also have, at New Hampshire, you have uh, Christopher Bell winning. So, this is going to be a little bit of a tip there of uh, probably who you should be picking here. Uh, he led 149 laps and won the race. So, we won both of those races. Phoenix and New Hampshire. Um, by the way, Chevy just won in the top. I think it was six there. One of the top six. That was Larson. Okay. So just quickly on the other races, uh, short tracks and the, the ones that are considered the most similar. Gateway, Iowa. You had Hamlin winning at Bristol. Led 163 in the win. You had Byron winning at Martinsville. Led 88. Uh, and then at Gateway, you had Sindrick, of course, uh, stealing that win, leading 53 laps. And then, by the way, Chevy did not have a top five there. Uh, Toyota did not have only, excuse me, they only had one in top 14 at uh, Iowa, but that doesn't really matter. Blaney uh, won that race, dominating, leading 200 and more laps. Okay, so let's go to these favorites here. And look, it's obvious. See, for me, what I'm going to do here is 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 I'm going, all right, well, like, I, like we just talked about with Chevy, this is not the week to take Larson when I've got these other three dominating-looking Toyota drivers at this racetrack. It's just no reason for me to take Larson this week, coming off a win, even though it's been a few weeks. Uh, just not going to do it. Not this week. And by the way, Larson was 14th at Phoenix and 4th at New Hampshire. Uh, and he was uh, third at even though, as you reminded uh, the viewers, leading 144 laps from the pole. But still, that was his best finish, so that does matter. But no wins in these in these three situations. Okay, so out of the top three, I just think Bell's the way to go. I've already put money on Bell this week. Uh, and, and he's not too low, um, but he's, he's around there. But I think he's definitely worth it. And the only reason he's not too low is because you have Trucks and Hamlin, um, who are equally as good. But Bell is so good here. And plus, I think the reason to go with him is not just because he won Phoenix in New Hampshire, because keep in mind, he was sixth at Richmond earlier this year. So he didn't he didn't have a great run there. You know, he led nine laps. Big deal. But he's never won there. So it's like in the Cup Series. So it's like he's overdue. Uh, that's why I'm like, OK, this is a perfect situation for Christopher Bell. By the way, uh, he has three wins out of five in the Xfinity Series leading 457 combined laps. So he dominated in the Xfinity Series here. He's looked good in the Cup Series with four top fives out of eight. That's 50%. Yes, I can add. And by the way, he's coming up for fourth at Indianapolis, which is, you know, uh, even though uh, it's been a couple weeks, uh, he still uh, is on top of his game. Uh, Where the other two, Hamlin and Truex, also have equally awesome stats here. Uh, Let's remember... Hamlin is still in a situation where he has just one top five in his last seven. And Truex is in a situation where he doesn't have a top five in his last ten. So it just I just think it just makes more sense to go with Christopher Bell if you're going to be making that pick out of these top four drivers. Absolutely no question. Christopher Bell is the one to go with here. Um, it's out of eight Richmond starts alone, not even considering his success on those other tracks. He's got six top 10 finishes, and he only started inside the top 20 at this track, the top 20 three times, um, which is just unbelievable. His best finish at this track was a runner-up when he started 21st. Uh, he finished <laughs> earlier this year after starting 29th. He was the biggest mover forward in that race. This week, they also have the options higher, so I think even if he qualifies dead last, he's going to have plenty of options strategy-wise to be able to move forward. So certainly of these three, Christopher Bells has to be your guy. Truex still, it, it, I, I want to see if the couple of off weeks, if he's able to make a fresh start. Um, so, you know, give me a discount on him. Maybe I consider him. But if he's a favorite, you know, after what he's been doing in the lead up to the break, no, I, I'm going to go with Christopher Bell. The only spot where you end up with a question, or I guess maybe the first stop where you end up with a question as to which direction to go would be when you compare Bell and Hamlin. Hamlin has just been so good at this track over the history. He won here, obviously, uh, earlier this year. 
Um, he has a lot of stuff going his way this season, and based on the way that he's been running, yeah, he had a little bit of a slow streak going into the break, but he's been one of the most, you know, one of the biggest favorites, I, I should say, pretty much all season from a championship standpoint. He's going to turn up that wick as we get closer to the playoffs here. So certainly Bell's top choice of the top three. Uh, it might be a little bit closer when you throw a Hamlin there and compare the top four. Yeah, uh, I agree. I, I, I and, and the, reason, the other reason why I also like Hamlin in this situation after Bell is because you're getting six to one with Hamlin, which I don't think should be the case. I think Hamlin should be the co-favorite with Bell, and Agreed. Truex should be swapped uh, based on. Uh, I mean, again, it's all because of how Truex dominated earlier this year. That's it. But he's led over 1,500 laps. Truex has in his career. 10 top fives out of 36 with three wins, swept 2019, and in his last 15 races, nine of those are top fives, three of those are wins, and over 1,500 uh, laps led during that stretch. So, yes, you know how good he is there at Hamlin. 19 top fives out of 35 with five wins, and he's led over 2,200 laps. So both of them are definitely – that's why I'm saying it just doesn't really make much sense to go with Larson out of this group. It just doesn't. Not to say Larson can't win it. We know he can, but – Statistically speaking, historically speaking, uh, he would not be the top pick or even the top two and maybe not even my top three out of those four. Okay, let's uh, go to the next uh, group here. Uh, We've got Logano, Byron, Blaney, and Elliott. And out of this group, uh, I I guess Logano is down from 14 to 1. So uh, he was 14 to 1 a few days ago. So uh, people are starting to put a little money on. And Blaney's up. So I, I like this because I thought Blaney at 10 to 1 and Logano at 14 to 1, which is what what they were 24 hours ago. It might have been when we did our show yesterday. That's what the odds would have been. But now I think they're better because Logano should be 11 and Blaney should be 12. I, I didn't. I don't understand. I know Blaney's red hot, but he's never really done much here, even though he does. He has, he's had, he has had one good run. Uh, so it's not like he's been zero here. Uh, that was in uh, 2022 when he led 128 laps from the pole and finished seventh, his best. But other than that, it's all about how well he's doing with six top tens in his last seven, three top fives, and two wins. But Logano, he has a couple of wins here. Blaney only has three top tens and 16 appearances. He's never had a top five. Uh, Logano has a couple of wins here. He was second, as we mentioned, in March. And if you look at it over his last uh, 20 12 of those are top fives, two of those are wins, and all 60, 651 of, his, of, the, of the laps that he's led at this track have all come within the last 20. Uh, didn't have a lap in his first 10 here. Um, here's the other thing. Uh, we talked about this uh, at the Brickyard, and it continues. He's alternating good and bad over his last, I believe, eight races right now in the Cup Series. So uh, that means if that continues, he's going to have a good week. And what we mean by that uh, is it started, I believe, at Gateway, uh, might have been, or maybe even it could say before that at Charlotte, 14th, 5th, 21st, 6th, 32nd, 1st, 23rd, 5th, 34th. So uh, if he continues that uh, inconsistency, uh, he would have a good run here. Uh, So I like Logano because of that out of this group. Logano's the best for me, uh, past winner uh, two times. Uh, He was second uh, earlier this year, qualified inside the top 10. Uh, His last four races at the track were all seventh or better. Uh, Hasn't led laps in the last three, so that's a little bit of a question mark, but he did lead 222 in his sixth place finish in the fall of 2022. Uh, Like you said, that back and forth, it caught me out at Brickyard because I thought he was probably poised to do a little bit better, so I think he was one of my choices. Uh, But he's continued on that up and down bounce, so I would predict him being in the top five. From a standpoint of the rest of the drivers, I think Blaney is somebody you got to consider from a fantasy perspective because I I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't put him in a position to to win this week just because he could win. Uh, But I wouldn't, you know, make him the my choice here necessarily because again, at this particular track, he's really only got a couple of of bright spots. The rest of them have been pretty mediocre. Uh, But I think the way that he has been running more recently uh his frustration from indianapolis he's going to come out swinging again so i think you're looking at a potential top five 
from him. I will see how that that all plays out, and he could he could win. Uh, but I think from a uh, if you're picking the winner standpoint of these four, Logano uh, would be the one that I give the edge to just of his past history and the way that he's been going at this track in particular most recently. Yeah, I think what I want to see from Blaney is uh, what we said in the beginning is I'd li- I'd like to see Blaney not qualify all that well, which is very mm-hmm. possible, and then uh, maybe he's eighteen to one or twenty yep. to one. Then I'll throw a few bucks on him to win. Okay, twelve to one can't do it, but. Uh, maybe if you get uh, lucky with the uh, qualifying numbers. All right. Uh, by the way, Elliot has not had a top five in his last five on the season, and he has only led six laps with four next gen races at this track. Never won it. Uh, and uh, Byron, uh, he might be interesting only because he led 117 laps in the uh, in, in a race uh, last year, and then also led 122 laps in a race in 2022. So he's had at least one of those really good runs at this racetrack. Uh, and since he didn't lead, I don't think any laps in March, maybe he's going to have a good run. Uh, if that continues. Yeah. So my biggest question with Byron really is just the lack of productivity. He started the season so strongly as we got to the break, it kind of trailed off. So I still have questions there again. It's a chance for him to do a restart, uh, but certainly of that bunch, I'd prefer Logano. And he's driving a Chevy too. That's so. All right, uh, out of this group, you got the two teammates there, Kozlowski 14, Busher 16. you got Reddick 18, Gibbs 22. Uh, so uh, I definitely would be interested, to tell you the truth, in uh, I, I, I think all of these drivers are not bad to keep an eye on. So I want to see how, how, how their numbers look, of course, after qualifying. But Reddick at 18-1 to 1, I think is a really good play because how hot he was towards the end of the break Eight top tens in his last nine, five top fives, and two runner-ups in his last three. You are just uh, as hot as you can be without a win. And he was sixth at New Hampshire, tenth at Phoenix, leading a combined 121 laps. So there's that. He was tenth this year, which was his best finish. So that's important to note. And he led 81 laps in this race last year from the pole. So there's uh, even though he doesn't have a good history here, his best races have been the last two races he's had here. He's red hot. You're getting 18 to one. Uh, I think Reddick is definitely um, a good play because of that. And then again, Busher Kozlowski. By the way, Kozlowski was 20 to one on our if we would have recorded yesterday. Now he's down to 14. I don't like him at 14. I like him at 20. 14, and eh, I think I wait for qualifying before I put money on him. But I, I like putting money on him at 20th, uh, 20 to one. Excuse me. Uh, keep in mind he has not had a top five. At this track since his 2020 win, when he led 192 laps in that race, he's had four Xfinity wins here, two Cup wins here. He does not have a top five in his last seven in the Cup Series, so he's not really coming in hot either. And But what you do like about the teammates is is that Busher's the defending champ. Um, he's been strong since the next gen at Richmond, including leading 88 laps in the win last year. He was second at Phoenix this year, fifth at New Hampshire this year. Uh, Kozlowski, meanwhile, led 102 laps in this race last year with Busher winning this race, and he finished sixth. So um, that's why I think they're both into play. Uh, and Gibbs, meanwhile, just one top five in his last nine on the season. He was third at Phoenix. Uh, and he has a win in the Xfinity Series, but that really hasn't mattered as much now the longer we're going into his cup career because he's not – he hasn't won anything. So um, – yeah, I I like the fact he's twenty two to one and he's driving a Toyota, uh, so I, I I keep an eye on that. But anyway, well, yeah, I, I think all these drivers are in play. Yeah, I think all of them are make for compelling choices. Um, Busher probably stands out the most to me uh, because it's a fall race at Richmond. The last two fall races is where he's had his most success. So he was third in the fall of twenty twenty three. Um, uh, I'm sorry, 2022, and then 2023, he was the winner uh, from 26 spot, leading 88 laps, like you said. Kozlowski has a tendency to lead a lot, lot of laps here, uh, a past winner as well. Reddick has been so hot leading up to the break, I think he's going to come out swinging as well. Biggest question mark for me is Ty Gibbs, and not to say that uh, he doesn't have the potential, because we all know he does. It's just a matter of he's only had four races here. Um, just one top 10. So a little bit of question marks around him compared to the history of the other guys. Uh, but I think all four worthy choices. Busher, probably the one that stands out most to me just because of the fall aspect the past couple seasons. Those have been the best races for him at Richmond. All right. Now, uh, 
here, again, the odds are different from yesterday. Uh, Bowman is down to 22. He was 28 yesterday. I still don't like Bowman anyway, uh, except the fact that I like the way he was racing towards the end of the break. Um, and, and by the way, he would have had a much better result here in March, but he got stuck, I believe, on the pit when Kyle Busch brought out a caution and it totally ruined his day. He was doing well. He was up front. Caution comes out, puts him in a bad spot. I think it might have put him down a lap or something like that, and he never got it back. So just keep that in mind. He, he has one here, typical Bowman fashion, leading 10 laps and winning the race. Um, but anyway, he is down to 2022. Chastain is just in a bad rut. He has two top fives on the year. That's how bad things have been. Um, meanwhile, he was 15th in March. I believe he started third in that race, too. He has one top five in 11 appearances here. Even though he had a good run in his last four Xfinity races at Richmond, it has not translated, uh, and he's just not racing well. Even though the odds have dropped from 33 to 25, which I really don't know why. Same thing with Kyle. I don't know why he's dropping from 33 to 25. He has six wins here, yes. He's been a dominant racer here, yes. But he's led two laps since the next gen. So, And we know how things are going with him. Josh Berry. I took Josh Berry yesterday. I got him at 40 to 1. I was happy to get him at 40 to 1. Uh, I'm not so happy he's 25 to 1 now, but it's like, okay, the number's still high enough. And the reason is, is because uh, of several things. He's raced twice in the Cup Series, 11th in March from the 30th position, and second in this race last year, which is his best finish, obviously, and he was 30th. So just imagine if he can do a better job of uh, starting better than 30th. Um, Xfinity series, three top tens out of four. One of those top fives led 36, excuse me, 63 laps from the third position. Uh, actually we finished third, uh, which was his best finish leading 63 laps in the race in the Xfinity series last March. So a lot going for him and throw in the fact that he was third at New Hampshire, but let's keep in mind, he does not have a top 15 in his last four races. That's why I'm a little bit, and it's Josh Berry. So I, I just prefer him at 40, but I wouldn't mind if you uh, still wanted to go with him at 25. Yeah, no way I'm touching Kyle Busch um, with the rut that he's been in. You, Chastain, it's been a rough season. I, I'm with you. I don't think he's going to make the playoffs. Um, so it's between Bowman and Barry of this group. Um, Bowman, maybe a little bit of the edge just because of the fact that he was racing so well before we got to the break. Uh, but like you said, Josh Berry, this is a very good track for him. Kind of like Gibbs, though, he's not got a, a ton of history to go on in, in this series. The second place finish was when he was substituting for Chase Elliott. Yeah, he had an 11th place finish with Stuart Haas. He led two laps. So, you know, Stuart Haas isn't Hendrick, of course. It's not the number nine car, so a little bit of a discount there. Uh, so probably give the edge to Bowman. But uh, Berry's a pretty good choice. I would have rather had him where you got him at the 40-1. to 1. And then uh, one more at this range is Wallace at 35 and I think that he's definitely somebody to keep an eye on and and you're getting 35 still and that's because in his last four races before the break all of them in the top 15 three of them in the top 10 and one was fifth so he's going through his best stretch of the season it looks like um even though he's never had a top 10 at this track in 12 finishes that there's that but he led 80 laps in this race last year uh, even though he did not have a good finish uh, in March, I believe, or nothing great. Keep this in mind, though. In his first eight races at Richmond, he, his average finish was 25.1. His last four, average 15.0. And in his last Xfinity Series race, way back in 2017, he finished sixth. And he has an average of 11.7 in six Xfinity Series races, which is pretty good for Bubba Wallace. So this is not a bad track for Bubba. I would not be surprised if he was able to win a race at, at some point. Uh, and you're getting 35 to 1. As far as, and then they say a big gap to all the other long shots who are like over 100 to 1 or more. And out of all of those, I mean, really none of them, I think, stick out enough. Uh, the only ones that do for me would be just the fact that Gilliland has two top 10s in his last three. Stenhouse has four top 12s in his last six. And Gregson, uh, he has an Xfinity Series win. Very good numbers in Xfinity Series and has two top tens in his last four. Uh, but other than that, uh, this is not one of those weeks to take a super long shot. Yep, I would agree. I think the last one, you probably all the names that you threw out on the super long shots, um, very good ones. And 
perhaps maybe somebody that you want to take a flyer on from a fantasy standpoint. Uh, the most compelling one, certainly Bubba Wallace. He's been getting better at Richmond more recently. His best finish is a 12th, which he's done twice. Uh, 12th and 13th are his last two finishes at this track. And he led laps in each of his last three, which are all the laps that he's led at Richmond. So he's improving at this track. Uh, he's in a Toyota. Um, so I think of the, the deep long spots, Bubba Wallace is probably the clear one to go with. All right, pick time. What are you gonna? What, what are your top uh, three picks? Uh, so my top pick, I'll, you know, I'll go with um, I'll go with Hamlin for the repeat yeah. because I think the odds are a bit better than Bell. Okay. Uh, I think it's kind of a coin flip for me between those two. Uh, my middle pick, let's go with um, let's uh, let's switch it up a little bit. Let's go with a Ford, and we'll go with Logano for my middle pick. Okay. And, and we will put Bubba Wallace as my long shot. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go. I like it. We're, we're different there. I'm going to go Bell first, Reddick second. And since you take Wallace, I'll take Berry as uh, my uh, long shot. Long, long, long shot. All right. So, again, I have no idea why this race is at 630. Uh, maybe you can find out, uh, your fans out there. But check us out on Prime Sports Network on Saturday for the, the starting lineup show. And our next uh, show is next. Hopefully, we'll be back to Tuesday. And the next uh, race is Michigan. So we have Michigan. And then the week after that, we get back to F1 with Correct. the Netherlands. You and, got it. And NASCAR that week is in Daytona on a Saturday night. Finally, a Saturday night race versus a Sunday night race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever that's about. All right, so again, just check out our starting lineup show, uh, and it's always going to be, uh, at least for now, it's always going to be just minutes after qualifying is over. Uh, put everything together right away, and then boom, I'll, I'll, I'll put the video up on Prime Sports Network. I have no idea how I'm going to handle this when college football season starts, but I'll I'll figure it out. So that's when we're going to have to really like find out when the qualifying is. And then, you know, cause I, I may not be able to do it right away. Uh, cause I'd be doing a post game show, uh, on uh, all season on the college football team, Penn state. So after every Penn state game, I'm going to be busy for about an hour and a half. So that might conflict, but I'll still be posting these reports. It just may not happen right after qualifying ends, but we'll, we'll remind everybody. All right, CJ, good to have you back. Good to be back. And we'll see how this goes. This should be an interesting restart to the 2024 season. Sounds good. All right. And uh, thanks out there. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that cool stuff. And we'll see you next time in comments, too. Uh, let us know. Well, next week, we'll have a little bit more time to check out from uh, previous comments and uh, questions and things like that from our viewers. We'll go over that on next week's show.